present in the book. Champollion, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. I'm not very good at French. Actually, I know literally no French. <laughs> so, he defined the nature of hieroglyphic writing as this. It is a complex system of writing that is pictorial, ideograms, symbolic, determinatives, and phonetic phonograms at one and the same time in a single text, a single phrase, and even in a single word. Each of these types of character aids in the notation of ideas by different means. It is a code. This is something fascinating to me, that rather than describing it as a language, it is a code. Right? So you can think about what differentiates a code from a language. And I don't really know, but I think a code has a sort of sacred or secretive purpose. We think about language as being meant to communicate to hundreds of thousands of millions of billions of people, right? Language is about communication. Code is about communication, but only to a select few. Language is about communicating to as many people as possible, but code is separate. It's resigned for, or, or it's um, protected for only those that know how to read it. This is interesting because, um, let me get some water and then I'll tell you why. <laughs> Hieroglyphs are considered a sacred language and all that we know of hieroglyphs, so much of it came from deciphering the names of these incredibly holy people. And so it definitely feels like a language of royalty. A language that is preserved only for the privileged. Very different from how we see language as a tool here, now, or learning as a method of social mobility. Learning that is and should be available to all um, as a kind of capital that we all are deserving of. This language is very different. It is reserved. It is not for everyone. And that's so how I interpret the use of the word code there. Now, let's look now at how complex this really is. As you can see, we have the phonetic symbol, as I've stated there, but then you have the determinative. This says the er. Er and the ah sound. Then this is the sun here, so we know that Ra is the sun. That means you have the phonogram and you have the determinative. <coughs> the phon or the ideogram, ideogram, will always have this little strike there, which helps us understand which one it is. So here you can see the sun has that little strike. It's telling us this is the ideogram. It's the determinative or the pictorial sign. Okay. The ideogram. The determinative is going to represent an idea. And those ideas are abstract in nature. And so we know that images are excellent at determining abstracts. If you look at this picture, what do you think it would be? It's a man on his knees pointing to its mouth. Well, this one, this symbol is used to designate anything related to eating, drinking, reading aloud, shouting, and singing. Here we have legs. This is a, a pair of moving legs. This indicates the action of walking. So we have, as I've written here, I'll just rewrite it, a verb, right? And our verb action.
actually looks like movement, like action. So it's a fascinating way that language actually has its meaning, not just um, in these symbols that really have no relationship to what they are depicting, but actually do resemble in some way the concept that it is trying to communicate. Very different from our own language, where you can look at, for instance, the word dog and ask yourself, where is it? You know, you can't actually see a dog in that, right? The signs here have no relationship to an actual dog, but in this case, the legs do. And speaking of walking, and it is the image of walking. Very different. Now we have here, this three-part sign here is, as you can imagine, an image of water. And again, it resembles water because it is a determinative sign. Here we have a pronunciation guide, but we're going to skip right over this and get straight to looking at the different images. Okay. So here yeah, the book is showing us all of these different symbols. It breaks up um, all of the different symbols into these word analyses. As you can see, we have these symbols, and these symbols are all lining up to equal one word, which is cat. So it's definitely not a utilitarian language, as you can see, because for one word, we need three very complex symbols. <laughs> and so as you can see, it is definitely a code, and it's a sacred code, not so much a language for communication in the way that we would think, or the written language, rather, and different than in the oral language, of course. So this first sign, they say, is biliteral, which means it stands for two letters, M-I. Pictorially, it is a milk jar, but phonetically, it represents M-I. So you can think about why would a milk jar be associated with a cat, but the deterministic value of the letter doesn't always matter. This one is a phonetic, and as you can see, it comes before the determinative, which is right here, obviously. That's a cat. <laughs> so it's a determinative, but it doesn't tell us how to say cat, unfortunately. These tell us how to say cat. It's all very complicated. So the second sign, pictorially a quail, monoliteral, standing for the single sound, W. So the third sign is the determinant in the form of a cat. It shows the preceding mu means cat, mu. Okay, so we have a few more here. We have this interesting symbol. I wonder what this is. So let's see. A solar disk with three rays. Okay, so this is rays. In the form of an animal skin pierced by an arrow, it stands for two consonants, sit. And the second sign, a small semicircle right here, that is actually a loaf of bread. <laughs> it doesn't look like a loaf of bread, but apparently it is. So we have Set, set, and then bread. Okay, which is T. It is a phonetic complement of the set sign and is not to be pronounced individually. The third sign, the quail, stands for the single sound, W, W, W. The fourth sign is another T, this time pronounced on its own. The determinant is a solar disk with three rays. So the whole root word is setut, setut meaning rays or sunbeams. So in the morning, when you see the sun, you can say setut, setut, setut. <laughs> so meaning rays. Like look at the setut from the window. And this is the very complex kind of order of images that would make that. So there's a lot going on there <laughs> to say one little word. 
let's look at another one. I like these because these are just like um, we were saying in the previous pages. If I go back here, where we're talking about abstract ideas, I like the idea that these here are very abstract. Our, it's concrete, but also an hour is time, and time can be very abstract in life as well. I guess what I mean by abstract is they don't have like a physical body or like they don't have um they're not um what am I trying to say? They're not they don't have a signifier, like or they're not signified. There's no hour in the world. They're not um manifest or like gosh, I'm really <laughs> struggling with this. <laughs> don't have physical bodies. They're not things. They're ideas, right? So I think that's what I really like about these words. So let's see how the Egyptians, or the ancient Egyptians, put our together. Put my glasses, I took my glasses off. Put my glasses back on so I can read it. All right. The first sign depicting a hair stands for un. So this guy, the way we pronounce him, is un, un, fluid, un, 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 and it's like just another compliment. So it seems like that happens a lot that we have one phonetic um, sound and it's complemented by another. So we have un, and that's a wave, like much like again. If we look over here, it's much like the water. I bring it back. Very similar. So, un. And then a face. Another thing that holds water. Anu. So we have anu. And the fourth sign depicting a semicircular loaf. We have the bread again. So it seems that bread <laughs> is very important and it probably represents. If anyone's seen Moonstruck, or Nick Cage goes, what is life? They say bread is life. <laughs> so maybe there's something to that because in the Egyptian, ancient Egyptians are using bread a lot for everything. Anyway, so stands for tea. So anunt, anunt, anut, anut, anut. The star by the solar disk. So there's our star. Our determinants denoting time. So these are the determinants here. So we're saying time. And these, all these are our phonetics. Okay. So our is anut. Anut. So in the morning, the sitat. In the morning, anut. The sitat comes through the window. <laughs> we're getting there. We're, we're speaking. Um, and at the morning, Anut, the sun comes through the window as Situt. Good. <laughs> We're learning. So these are signs with only one syllable. To burn is a verb. So that's interesting. Papyrus thicket. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't see it. There we go. So this one's to burn. We have a papyrus thicket. So this this um, falcon here goes ah, uh, and then we have another ah, uh, but with a different. So I guess we gotta go to the pronunciation, but I don't really care all that much to go all the way back. The winged solar disk. I'm interested to see like what the winged solar disk actually means. Let's keep going. 
the Nazis black and white. Um, at least I don't think they are. A sycamore tree. It's very beautiful. And you have the waving symbol again, the water symbol. So often appearing. Or 
diversifies and grows and shows us how much as a society we are diversifying and growing. It's really incredible how complex and beautiful language can become. That's why we should always resist the um, reduction of language, you know, kind of like in 1984, that, that book. All right. That book, I don't know if you've read it, but um, the book thought about the concept of what if you took language away rather than growing it. Every year you took words away and you erased them from the lexicon. You would get closer and closer, I suppose, to something like this, which is a language reserved for the holiest of people. You would reduce society's opportunities and diversity down to only a select few. Um, and so it's interesting to look at the, this beginning of language and compare it to where we are now, but also where we could, could potentially go. Okay. Interesting. 
So how does that sound without any vowels? Let's see. M as in English, W. Wa, wa. So how does that? Wa.